Oh 
you this morning. My name is Will Rogan. My family and I have the uh, opportunity to serve here in a few different capacities, so we're just so thankful to be a part of Somerville Baptist. Um, if it's your first Sunday here, raise your hand. We'd love to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Um, you're, you're our special guest today. I really mean that. And um, if it's your first time or if you've been here a few times, you're looking for a way to get connected. On the way out, there's a few black tables. You'll see these uh, white with the green stripe communication cards. What we uh, invite you to fill one of those out um, or grab someone. We'd love to get to know you better uh, and get you plugged in here at Somerville Baptist. Uh, one other question, any football fans in the room? All right, a few more of those, good. Um, to, you know, I, I draw a little bit of a parallel between Easter Sunday and Super Bowl Sunday, or maybe for college football fans, the national championship, except for Easter's infinitely better because we know who wins the battle, right? Um, the battle, the epic battle 2,000 years ago between life and death, um, you, you put yourself on Friday, Good Friday, when Jesus died, evil thought, you know, Satan thought he had won, right? Satan was up. Jesus was in the grave, the tomb was closed. But on Sunday, we get to celebrate the tomb being opened, Jesus raising from the dead, and he's, uh, he's alive and he's with us today. Amen. I wanted to share with you real quick from Philippians 2, one of my favorite uh, passages. Verse 5 says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. One of our core values here at Somerville Baptist is that nothing compares to a changed life. And when you accept Jesus into your life, you are changed forever. In 2 Corinthians, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Will you pray with me this morning? God, we just come to you and we're just so thankful for the gift of your son, Lord, that he came and he suffered. He lived a perfect life. And that on Easter, Lord, he came back to life. He conquered death. And we get to celebrate that today, Lord. And I pray for everyone here in the room that you would just get our, capture our hearts this morning. Lord, help us to worship you, to see you. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and welcome those around you. privilege at both campuses and all five services today to celebrate baptism, to celebrate exactly what Will is talking about, nothing comparing to a changed life. This is my friend Annika Byerly and her family uh, up here this morning. Annika has placed her faith in Jesus and has now come to the point where she says, hey, I want to publicly declare to the church that I belong to Jesus, that I'm part of his family, that I'm sent out on mission for him. And so for us, baptism, it's, a, it's an outward symbol of the inward change that God has worked in our hearts. Paul describes baptism like this in Colossians 2. He says, in, in baptism, we have been buried with Christ. And we were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And then Paul says to anybody who's placed their faith in Jesus, you who were dead in your trespasses and the sin of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our sin by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Baptism, it's two things. It's one, it's a symbol of our surrender to Christ, but it's a visible picture of the victory of Almighty God, amen? As we see a new creation in Christ, the sin is washed away, the shame is paid for. We are raised to walk in newness of life. So I'm gonna turn my mic off. I'm gonna pray with Annika and her family. And as we pray and as we celebrate Annika's baptism, our team's gonna lead us in singing what he's done as we celebrate the grace of Almighty God.
Break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness took through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Salvation in your name, 
that for you, those are more than just words that we're singing. I hope that's the reality of your life, that Jesus is your living hope. If he's not, that's the invitation on the table for you today. You may have come in here confused and broken, uncertain about the future. There is living hope available to you today. While we're standing, we're going to read our passage of Scripture for the day. The context of Luke 24, Jesus has been crucified on a cross on Friday at the hands of the Roman Empire, at the behest of the Jewish religious leaders. Jesus is hung from nails that are pierced through his hands and his feet. And he dies on Friday, on Saturday. Confusion and pain is ruling and reigning that day. Disciples don't know what's happening. There's a spiritual battle that is raging as darkness thinks it has won on Saturday. And Luke 24 says this, on the first day of the week, Sunday at early dawn, they went to the tomb. We'll find out who they are in just a moment. Taking the spices that they had prepared. They're they're going to finalize the burial process. They're going to anoint the body of Jesus in their final act of customary burial. When, When they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, they're confused. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they, the disciples, were were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day, rise. And they remembered Jesus' words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. That's the they. It was Mary and Joanna and the other Mary and other women. They were the they, the disciples at the tomb that morning. But these words seem to the 11 and the rest an idle tale, a fairy tale, a shot in the dark. There's no way that someone who was dead, someone we saw die, there's no way he came back to life. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So Father, that is our prayer today, that God, regardless of how we came in the room, that we would walk out marveling at the empty tomb. God, maybe we walked in and we're hurting, we're confused. The future seems uncertain. Life has happened to us and it is not going according to plan. Leave us in all today of the empty tomb. Father, may the power of the resurrection encounter our lives. And God, may we be transformed by the grace of God in Christ. God, may your truth shine brightly in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, and everybody says together, amen. You can be seated this morning. Happy Easter. Thanks so much for being at church. What a phenomenal day it's been already. Aren't you glad you're in church this morning? Have uh, have you ever been confused, though? I mean, are you human? You know, have you ever had a moment in life you're like, this is confusing. Life is confusing. The world is confusing. I'm confused. So I was driving the other day uh, with my four-year-old in the backseat of the truck. And uh, as we're driving down the road, my, my four-year-old says, Daddy. And I was like, yes, sir. And he said, I have a question. I said, all right, what's, what's your question, bud? Are you married? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, believe it or not, son. Yeah, I am. Um, And he and and Judah, my four-year-old, goes, hmm, hmm, wow, that's weird. And I was like, I I agree, you know, it can be, it can be strange sometimes. But, um, and then he followed that first question up with another question. He said, who are you married to? (laughs) And I was like, well, um, it's a good teaching moment, right? Here we go. Um, You know, life's confusing. Judah's confused. Let's teach a little bit. Judah, I am married to your mom. (laughs) To Tara, mommy, you call her mommy, you know? He's like, oh. 
And he said again, he said, wow. <laughs> and then, and then he said this, he said, I do not understand how that happened. <laughs> and I was like, dude, don't tell her that because I don't understand how that happened either. My dad's been telling me for almost a decade that I outpunted my coverage when Tara agreed to marry me. And that is absolutely true. I did, Judah, I'm confused as you are. Don't tell her that we're confused about how this happened. But here's the reality, whether you're four or 44 or 84, life can be confusing. There are moments where we look around and we're like, wow, I don't understand how that happened. I don't know. I'm not even sure what just happened. I don't know what just happened. Life is confusing. And if you're honest, it, what often follows confusion is pain. What often follows confusion is uncertainty and anxiety. When, when we don't know what the future holds, that's a difficult place to be. And that's exactly where the disciples find themselves in Luke 24. The, the future has become cloudy. The crucifixion of Jesus on Friday has introduced into their life a, a whole different level of pain and uncertainty. The one they had followed for three years, the one they had trusted in, the one in whom they had placed their hope is dead and buried in a tomb and the disciples don't know what to do. And it's in that place that confusion grows and pain grows and uncertainty grows, anxiety grows. And, and here's the reality for us today. Life will be challenging. There'll be moments of uncertainty and anxiety and pain and difficulty. And, and if we as people don't know how to process life, process the information that's coming in, process the, the sources that are feeding us the information that we're hearing. If we don't know how to sort through life, we're in for a rocky ride. We're in for a bumpy journey. Today's title is how to think clearly in an unclear world. Life is unclear. And so how do we as people think clearly about the world around us. If we know anything about pain and anxiety, it, it robs us of the ability to think clearly. Here's the premise of today's conversation. When, when life is unclear, we need a starting point. When things are uncertain, we need a foundation. When life gets difficult and the circumstances in our lives become painful, we need a solid rock upon which to stand. And just to put all my cards on the table this morning, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is the starting point. He is the one that allows us to ride the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows of life with stability in an unstable world. I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that his word is truth, that he is the only way to the Father, and that his life in exchange for my life is my opportunity for hope today and forever. I believe he's the starting point by which I can now interpret the world around me. So when life is unclear, I've got a way, a process to think clearly. I go to Jesus and that's my invitation to you from the top. When life is unclear, turn to Jesus. When you don't know what to do, go to Jesus. When you don't know where to turn, look to Jesus. He's the starting point to allow us to think clearly in an unclear world. Like James, how, how do we know? How can I be confident in this? Well, just think about for a second the people that you know and how people process information. So many times when it comes to processing the world around us, we really don't think that much. Anybody agree with that? Like we, we don't think nearly as much as we should, right? I don't think nearly as much as I should. And maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you think all the time. But maybe you don't. Maybe you're like me. What do we do instead? Instead of thinking, what we often do, we, we react. We just react. Whatever we feel, we go that way. Whatever we want, we chase that. Whatever we think, we say. Whatever we desire, we do. We just react to the circumstances and the stimulus in front of us. Somebody hurts us, we lash out. Somebody says something unkind to us, we return fire with fire. We feel something on the inside and we act 
on it. We just react to the world around us. We spend all of our days not setting the pace, the trajectory, the course for our lives. We just react to whatever urgent thing pops up in front of us. That's why sometimes we go through two weeks of our life and we look around and we're like, what have I done? What have I accomplished? Nothing, because we've just been reacting to everything around us. And if we're honest, sometimes if we're not reacting, we're just repeating. We react based on what we feel, based on what emerges in front of us, and then we repeat whatever the cultural narrative of the moment is. Whatever the loudest voice is shouting at us, we just begin to believe that and think that and repeat that. We don't think critically and logically about the world. We just say, hey, what's everybody else saying? Let me say that too. Let me go with the flow. And here's the reality. To to follow Jesus means that we, we crucify our desire to react and to repeat. And rather, we begin to filter everything through the lens of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what Jesus has To say, and that puts us oftentimes at odds with what everybody else is doing and where everybody else is going. And so here's the question if I'm going to go against what everybody else is doing and say something that nobody else is saying, how can I be certain that Jesus is a good starting point for my life? If following him is going to put me at odds with culture and people and people in my office and maybe people in my family, if it's going to cause me to have to change some things in my life and maybe even from time to time go against my own desires and feelings and emotions, why would I consider starting with Jesus? Well, Luke 24, I think, gives us some insight. We just read how early on Sunday the women came to a tomb. That they expected to be occupied, and rather they found a stone rolled away. They found two guys in dazzling white clothes saying, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And so their confusion turns to hope, and they go back to Jerusalem looking for the apostles. They tell them, hey, here's what we found. Here's what we expected. Here's what we found. The apostles don't believe it, but Peter, he goes, looks at the tomb, and he leaves the tomb marveling at the fact that there's no body in the grave. Now, fast forward, we're going to read the rest of Luke 24 this morning, and we're going to see why Jesus is a solid starting point for us today. Luke records in verse 13, he says, that very day, So on Sunday, that same day, two of them, two of the disciples, not the 11 closest followers of Jesus, but but two of those who had been in the crowd of people following Jesus over the last few months of his life, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're getting out of the city of Jerusalem where things have become dangerous for the followers of Christ, and they're going to Emmaus. Maybe they're from Emmaus. Maybe they've lost hope and they're going back home. Maybe they're just afraid for their lives, and so they're trying to get out of town before they get persecuted as well. But they're going to Emmaus, seven-mile road, road, seven-mile journey, and, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Hey, can you believe that Jesus, the one who opened blind eyes and healed deaf ears and put lame people back on their feet and cause them to walk again. Can you believe that Jesus, the guy that called Lazarus out of the tomb and called him to live again, can you believe that Jesus died? Can you believe that our hope was crucified? Can you believe that Peter's denied Jesus three times and the disciples are scattered? Can you believe what's happened? While they're talking and discussing together these things, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So here's the scene. Picture the scene. Cleopas and his companion. We're going to find out his name is Cleopas in just a moment. They're walking this road, and all of a sudden, there's a third person walking on the road with them. We know. Who is it? It's Jesus. They don't know what we know. And this makes for some comedy, and it's fantastic. 
Their eyes were kept from recognizing in them, him, and Jesus said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? I love this, y'all. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. Jesus shows up, and he's like, hey, guys, what are you talking about? Now, he knows. Does he not? He knows. What are you talking about? They said to him, they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, named Cleopas, answered Jesus. Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? You're the only guy in town that doesn't know what's going on. And I love this. He said to them, Jesus said to them, what things? He's like, oh, no, really? Tell me more. What happened? What ha tell, tell me more. And so, verse 19, they begin to tell Jesus what happened to Jesus. Now, can you just imagine this conversation that Jesus is listening to them tell him what happened to him? He's like, whoa. No way. How did I miss it? <laughs> you know, like, just imagine this conversation. They're like, hey, it's about, we're, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Jesus is like, oh, my goodness. And we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Now, we read this, and y'all, I mean, like, to me, this is, it's, it's, it is, it's funny. We can laugh in church. This is funny. But at the same time, there's a depth to what is happening here that I don't want you to miss this morning. The disciples, Cleopas and his companion, they had hoped. Did you catch that? They had hoped. We had hoped. What had they hoped? They had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah, they had hoped that deliverance was finally here. They had hoped that their opportunity for forgiveness was in front of them. They had hoped that he was the promised one of God. They had hoped. But then something happened. In this case, they saw Jesus die on a cross. They saw him taken from the Roman cross and carried to a tomb. They saw him laid in the tomb. They saw the stone rolled in front of the entrance. And what they saw, what happened, destroyed what they had hoped. When Jesus died, their hope died. When Jesus died, confusion Emerged When Jesus died, their world was thrown into uncertainty. And by Sunday morning, their lives are marked by confusion and pain. We had hoped. But here's what happened. And maybe that's the scenario of your life today. You had hoped that this time was going to be different. You had hoped that... God was going to show up and he was going to do something in your life that only he could do. You, you had hoped that the relationship was going to be saved or the cancer was going to be healed. Or you had hoped that this time it would work out in your favor. You had hoped, but then what happened was not what you had hoped. And so where you are today is a place marked by confusion and uncertainty and pain. Maybe you're like the disciples standing still and looking sad. They're heartbroken and they don't know how to move forward. I, I talk to so many people in our world today that they say things like, I used to have faith in God. I used to believe. I used to worship. I used to pray. I used to be in the word. I used to be following after Jesus. But then here's what happened. And maybe that's where you are today. You used to. But today you're just here because somebody invited you and they said they'd take you to dinner after. And they wouldn't quit inviting you. So finally you're like, okay, I'll come. Just leave me alone. Be there on Sunday. Maybe that's, maybe that's why you're in the room. You, it has nothing to do with Jesus. It was just somebody invited you and you wanted to be a good friend and so you're here. But, but the reality is what happened has destroyed your hope. And, and for you, Jesus is a used to. I love that it is in that place that Jesus shows up on the road to Emmaus. He doesn't go search out the disciples that are holding strong in their faith. Even in the face of pain and uncertainty, he shows up to the two whose hope has been destroyed. And he meets them where they are. 
And he begins to do something incredible in their life. Watch what happens. They say to Jesus, moreover, some women of our company, they amazed us. They, they went to the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. You see what's happening here. They're like, all of this stuff is happening. Like, we're getting reports of this and we're hearing that. But, but we haven't seen Jesus haven't seen Jesus, they're confused. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So here's what happens, guys. Jesus shows up. He hears from the disciples how their hope has been destroyed by what happened. And he says to them, let me point you to truth. And he takes what in those days would would be called the Hebrew Bible. We would call it the Old Testament. And he walks them through the Old Testament, showing them how all of the Old Testament points forward to Jesus. Now, think about for a second the greatest teacher you've ever had. Anybody like math? Okay, this doesn't apply to you. Uh, If you don't like math, have you ever had a math teacher that actually made math tolerable? Uh, You gotta be a great teacher, just saying. If you're a math teacher, we love you, I love you, I just don't love math, right? Like, but you have a teacher that can just make a subject, make the content come alive. Can you imagine hearing Jesus teach God's word. So Jesus opens up the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and begins to explain to Cleopas and his companion how it points forward to him. Like, James, what did he say? I I don't know. I wasn't there, and we don't get a record in Luke, but but maybe, maybe Jesus said something like, hey, um, y'all remember, he wouldn't have said y'all because he, they didn't say that back then, but that's not the point. Maybe he said, hey, uh, think back to Genesis, the garden. Genesis chapter 3, you know the story. You know how, how Adam and Eve, they, they sinned and they ate from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from. And, and when they did, there was brokenness that was introduced into the relationship between God and humanity. There was rebellion on the part of people and it separated them from a holy God. And, and then God shows up in the garden and Adam and Eve start shaming and blaming each other. And, and then God curses the serpent, the deceiver, the snake, the Satan, the enemy of the people of God. And God says, to the serpent, there's going to come one from woman, a descendant of woman, who will one day crush the head of the snake. And Cleopas and his, wife, his companion, maybe it's his wife, maybe it's his friend, we don't know, but maybe, like, maybe they're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He crushed the head of the snake. He reversed The curse, he made it possible for the brokenness between God and man to be bridged. Jesus became the curse breaker and the redeemer. He is the son of God. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, that's that's amazing. Then Jesus, maybe he said something like, hey, think about Moses. Like, oh, yeah, we know Moses. Moses, he's a big deal. We know Moses. Yeah, I know you know Moses. Moses, what did he do? Well, Moses led the people of Israel out from Egyptian slavery. Like, oh, yeah, we know, we know that. Story. That's a great story. Part of the Red Sea, cross on dry ground, through the wilderness for 40 years. Like that, yeah, we love Moses. And then maybe Jesus said something like, well, you know, Moses, he freed the people from Egyptian slavery. But he didn't have the power to get the spirit of slavery out of their hearts. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't conquer the spirit of rebellion that lived inside the people of God. Jesus comes on the scene to be the greater Moses who actually has the power to lead the people of God into freedom. Maybe Cleopas and his companion are like, oh, amazing. And then Jesus might have said something like, oh, but think about David, the king chosen by God to to rule God's people, to lead them in the worship of God and to to be their leader, to, to guard their worship. What did David do? They'd be like, oh, well, you know, David was a man after God's own heart. He was a great king. Jesus might have said, was he perfect? And they'd have said, no, he wasn't. In fact, David failed pretty big. He, he blew it pretty big time. And, 
Then they, Jesus might have said something like, what about the rest of the kings that came after David? Did any of them get it right? They said, no, no. In fact, the, the kingdom, it, 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 it tanked after David. By the end of Solomon's reign, the kingdom was divided and civil war broke out. And then there was bad king after bad king after bad king. And no amount of kingly reform was able to reverse the hearts of the people back to God forever. Jesus is like, yeah, that's right. But then the son of God, the king of kings comes and he's the greater David. He's the greater king. He's the king with the authority to rule and reign forever. His throne will never pass away. Maybe they were like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And then Jesus got to the prophets. You know, David wrote some prophetic literature in the Psalms. Maybe Jesus said, hey, remember, remember on Friday on the cross as Jesus hung there, dying. Remember, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he said, yeah, yeah. Jesus said, where where, where did that come from? Maybe Cleopas, maybe he's an Old Testament scholar. Maybe he's like, oh, well, he's he's quoting Psalm 22. Jesus like, yeah, that's right, that's right. What's the rest of Psalm 22 say? Well, it talks about how how the the garments of of the the one who is who's who's being talked about in the psalm, the garments would be divided and, and the spoils would be split amongst the conquerors. And Jesus is like, yeah, what happened at the foot of the cross? Oh, the Roman soldiers, they divided the garments of Jesus and and they took them for himself. And Jesus might have said, Yeah. So who is Psalm 22 about? And they would have said, Oh my goodness, it's about. Jesus, Jesus on the cross was saying, hey, I am the one that David talked about in Psalm 22. And then Jesus might have said, what about Isaiah 53? Oh, yeah, the suffering servant, the one who is is under the curse of God, but not because he did anything wrong, because he took upon his own shoulders the sins of the world. And the punishment that is laid on his shoulders actually becomes our peace before God, and by his wounds we're healed. And Jesus is like, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And Cleopas and his companion are like, wow, it's amazing. What you're saying is that we've been prepared for this moment the whole time. All of the scriptures is pointing us to the cross. It's all about Jesus. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So then they get to Emmaus, and Jesus starts messing with them again. What happens? The disciples, Cleopas and his companion, like, all right, well, we're turning off here. We're going to go in and eat some dinner. And Jesus is like, all right, see you guys. He, Scripture literally says, y'all, you didn't laugh. You didn't see it yet. But it's it's funny. We'd hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Here's what happened. Jesus opens the Scriptures. They draw near to the village, verse 28, to which they were going. And Jesus acted as if he were going further. Like, all right, we're going here. And Jesus is like, have a great day. And he keeps on walking. And they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You come in with us. Come come eat dinner with us. Like, it's late. You can't keep walking. It's about to be dark outside. Come on in with us. It's toward evening. The day is now far spent. So Jesus goes in to stay with them. And something beautiful happens when he was at the table with them. Now, hang on just a second. Who invited who to the table? Cleopas and his companion invited Jesus to the table. They get to the table and who takes over? Jesus does. Jesus does. Maybe that's what needs to happen in your life today. You think you're inviting Jesus to the table, but what really Jesus wants to happen is for Jesus to take control of your life. Not so that he can tell you what to do, but so he can lead you into life. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. They get to the table. Jesus takes the bread. He blesses the bread. Father, thank you for this bread that you have given us for our life. He breaks the bread. He hands it to the disciples, and what do they see? They see his hands. Is it possible that in that moment they they see where the nails would have pierced his wrist in that moment as he breaks the bread, blesses it, hands it to them. Maybe they were around in the past when Jesus fed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And they saw him do the same thing, bless the bread, break it, and begin to pass it out. 
Maybe they heard about the upper room on Thursday night as the disciples celebrated Passover when Jesus blessed the bread, broke it, and then put a new meaning on the breaking of bread and the cup. Regardless, we know in this moment, Jesus blesses the bread. He breaks it. He passes it to the disciples, and their eyes are open. They see Jesus. They see him. And what happens next? He vanishes. Like if you didn't know that was coming, you would not see that coming. You would think, oh, my goodness, this is a moment of reunion. There's going to be a celebration. It's like, oh, it's Jesus. Boom, Jesus is gone. <laughs> like, what's going on? Right? What's happening here? And then what happens next is fascinating. I love it. He vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Why is Jesus the starting point for our interpretation of the world around us? Because Jesus is the truth. He is the life. He is the only way to the Father. The truth of Jesus burns with clarity in the midst of an unclear world. If you're here today and you know Jesus, you know what I mean when I say that the truth of Jesus burns in your heart. You know what the disciples are saying when they say that their hearts were burning within us as the teaching of the scriptures came to them from Jesus. You know what that is like. To have God illuminate his word in such a way that it leaves you in awe at the beauty and the wonder and the power of Jesus. Maybe today, for the first time, some things are beginning to connect in your mind. And you're like, well, there's some brokenness in me. I know I've not always been a perfect person. There's not a lot of peace in me. There's a lot of confusion and a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty about the future. And, you know, I, I really, to this point in time, haven't given a lot of thought to Jesus and the reality of Jesus. But today, as we've been talking from the word, something's been happening on the inside. And I don't think it's the guy up there talking. I think there's something about Jesus that is doing something on the inside of me. The truth of Jesus burns with clarity in an unclear world. And if you're in that place today of saying, I don't know what to do with Jesus, here's the question that we have to ask. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Because if he didn't, then we can just go home now and you don't need to come back next week. If he did not rise from the dead, we are wasting our time. We can stop singing. We can stop reading this. There's no point in prayer. We're wasting our breath in gathering and teaching the scriptures about Jesus. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then everything changes. And not only is he the resurrected king of kings. He is the authority that has every right to speak into my life. He's not just someone else's king. He's the king of everything. In fact, he is everything. He's our source of truth. He's our hope for the future. He's our peace in times of uncertainty. He's the love that we need to be made complete. He is forgiveness and he is grace. He is the revelation of God for our salvation. If Jesus rose from the dead, everything changes. And that's what these two realize in that room that night. Jesus is alive so much so they, it changes so much for them. They, they rise that same hour. They were concerned about Jesus going on ahead because it was dark outside. They're like, you can't travel tonight. It's too late. But when they realize that Jesus is alive, they're like, wait a minute. There's faith that's greater than our fear. They get up from the table and they're like, we've got to go back to Jerusalem. We're not just going a little ways. We've got to go seven miles the exact same way we just came because we've got a message that we need to tell. The Lord has risen indeed. He's alive. I believe it. I'm willing to give my life for it. I'm willing to run into the face of danger to proclaim it. Jesus is alive. They told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking 
of the bread. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've said yes to Jesus. You believe that Jesus is alive. You have answered that question in your heart. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. Here's my challenge to you today. Don't give up on Jesus in the space between happened and hoped. Don't give up on Jesus in what we'll call the space of Saturday. I hope God would do this, but here's what happened. Don't give up on Jesus in that space between. If Jesus has risen from the dead, then hope is never dead. I'm not saying God's gonna do exactly what you want him to do. I'm not gonna say that your hope is gonna be fulfilled exactly like you think it should. I'm just saying you can trust Jesus because he's alive and he's alive forevermore. Don't give up on Jesus in the space between happened and hoped. But if you're here today and You've never trusted Jesus as your savior. Are you willing to say yes to Jesus today? Are you willing to receive the free gift of his grace, the forgiveness that comes through the shedding of his blood? He took the nails for you. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're worried. Maybe you don't know what the future holds. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. He is the revelation of God for our salvation. Like, I'm not even sure what all this means. I don't know what the future holds. If I trust Jesus, Jesus is in your future. Let that be enough for you today. We had the egg venture yesterday morning. A group of us started moving some stuff to Memorial Stadium, McKissick Field, about 8 o'clock yesterday. And the egg venture kicked off about 10. And about 10, 15 minutes into the egg venture, uh, somebody comes up to me and says, hey, uh, Rhonda needs you. Rhonda's our minister to kids. And so I went over to where Rhonda was, and she was standing with a lady whose name is Brianna. And Brianna, 15 minutes into the egg venture yesterday, had made the decision that she was ready to say yes to Jesus. And so Rhonda says, hey, will you come and stand with us while we pray? And Brianna gives her life to Jesus. And Rhonda simply said to Brianna, are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus? And Brianna said, yes. And in that moment, Brianna moved from death to life in the name of Jesus. There, she was an old creation. She became a new creation yesterday morning. Why? Because she realized that God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. And Brianna left the egg venture yesterday with a couple of dozen Easter eggs and a new life in Jesus Christ. Come on. Yeah, we can clap for that this morning. And so here's what takes this day from being just another day to being a day that changes eternity. It's when you say yes to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I want to invite you now with every head bowed and every eye closed to place your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, to surrender to him. If that's you and you're ready to do that this morning, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Dear God. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe he rose from the dead. And today I surrender my life to him. With nobody looking around this morning, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, will you just raise your hand right where you are? Say, today I gave my life to Jesus for the very first time. Amazing. That's incredible. I want to invite you, if that's you today, when we stand and sing, step out from where you are and meet me at the back of the room. We'd love to to follow up with you this, this morning. Father, we are grateful for new life in Christ. God, that like Brianna yesterday, we're going to have people in this room this morning who came in here dead in their sin and who walk out of here alive today and forever in the name of Jesus. God, we celebrate new life in Christ today. Father, we respond now in worship in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing. If you prayed to give your life to Christ, meet me at the back. If you need to join the church or you need, just need somebody to pray with you about the uncertainty in your future, let's have a moment to respond to Jesus together today.
this chorus. This is just what we're gonna do before we sing this last song. It goes like this.
gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. We'll just privately worship Him where you are. your gratitude to Jesus for what he's done for us.
sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you are my healing. Now your love is the end and I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. to the screen then we have some good news for you after that as well is this live hi i'm ellie welcome to sb10 news here's what you need to know today's top story next week we start a new series In other news, join a life group. I'm a kid. Even I know that's a good idea. This has been SB Kid News. See you next week. I think there's a future for her in that. I don't know. That's, uh, that's Ellie with the news. Uh, Ellie is right. Uh, you don't want to miss next week. We're going to talk about politics and all the other stuff you're not supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving. So be back next Sunday and for the next series. It's going to be a blast. Got some good news to share with you guys today. Uh, this is Russ and Tiffany. Um, and in addition to celebrating their six-year anniversary today, they're coming to join the church, both followers of Christ. We welcome them. Glad to have you guys. And uh, and this is Kenneth and Nora. Um, And Kenneth and Nora come to join the church as well. Uh, Kenneth this morning gave his life to Jesus. And we get to celebrate his baptism. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Nothing compares to a changed life. Nothing compares to a changed life. And this is David and Deanne, uh, and they're coming as well to join the church. I called David Michael earlier when I prayed for him, and I told him I wasn't going to do it up here this time. It's David and Deanne. They're followers of Christ as well and coming to join the church. And so we celebrate with them as well today. So church family, uh, if you can love and support the six of these brothers and sisters in Christ as they grow in their faith, will you stand to your feet with me this morning? Um, Tara, will you lead the six of them back to the tables back there? On your way out, guys, if you'll stop by and say hey to them, introduce yourself. Uh, There'll be a quiz next week on names and all that stuff, guys. So uh, we'll do that next Sunday. But welcome them, make them feel loved, invite them to your life group, uh, and we will see you guys back here next Sunday. Here's your benediction for today. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 3, he says this, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. To him be honor and glory in the church and in Christ Jesus today and forever. Amen. Happy Easter. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.